For the freedom you fought for, and the flag you stood for. For the country we cherish, and the people we love. For the bravery you showed, and the fortitude you held. For the days of dedication, and the nights of devotion. For the miles you walked, and the skills you learned. For the months of training, and the years of service. For the memories you carry, of the battles you saw. For the legacy of your courage, and the honor you deserve. When our nation needed you most, you answered the call. A deep and unshakable sense of allegiance and responsibility. You were bold, you did not hesitate, and you did not walk away. You were gone for holidays and anniversaries and birthdays, because while we were living in peace and freedom, you were fighting for it. Thank you is not enough. We can't repay you, but we will promise to remember. You are the reason we can sing the land of the free and the home of the brave. You are the heroes among us. You are not forgotten. You are the veterans. We remember your courage, we honor your sacrifice, and we thank you today. And I know we have, uh, I know we have some vets in here. I won't, I won't call them out. I just say thank you, seriously, from the bottom of our hearts. Anybody here speak as a Deutsch? You would without them, right? I mean, this could break it down in more applicable ways. It just fantastic and the price you paid um, for our freedom. So I guess I'm not supposed to do that because I'm not a pet. But uh, last thing in the world we need right now is me getting emotional this early. So let's just walk that back. Hey, um, <laughs> all right, I stand up here. To, I want to, I feel like the last few Sundays I've just come up here with just too much gusto in me. I wanted to just pause this morning um, and just make a few announcements and just check in with you guys instead of just coming up here. And But um, we got a, a few things going on. We have a Christmas concert in a, in a cookie cafe coming up on um, on December 11th. This is what uh, Pastor Andy calls a an on-ramp, right? This is a perfect opportunity for people that maybe you've made relationships with. Maybe they wouldn't come on a Sunday, but they would come to this. And so I want to encourage you uh, to go all in and help us with this. Put it on your Facebook page. Invite your neighbors. Like, let this be something where maybe there's some animosity towards church or whatever in somebody's life that we can break down barriers through having just a really good time. And you'd be more than welcome to bring them as well. Um, I guess the slide's not there right now, but we showed it earlier, but we're having a big Thanksgiving feast here on Sunday, November 20th, and uh, we're not going to promote that one, but you'd be more than welcome, of course, to bring a guest and bring a, f a friend, and so if you haven't signed up in the foyer to bring some food, you appreciate that, and normally it has been a fantastic night for this church. Like, you don't want to say, if we do one thing well, it's that. I like to think we can do more than that just well, but... It is always a night where we just have a good time. So Olu and Andy and I were putting our heads together on some ways to have fun that evening, but just come and, and give thanks. And maybe we'll have a time of some testimonies and stuff like that. So really uh, hope you guys will sign up to bring something. If the situation dictates that you can't, don't worry about it. Come anyway, okay? And then one other announcement I wanted to make um, is, is with regards to these welcome compass and on the back is a way for you to check in with us to to put in your prayer requests i do enjoy your doodling when i clean up after uh, i hope somebody who really went to town on one of these things wasn't thinking of me but you really did it in but that's okay <laughs> you can do that but it can fill one out from time to time and if there's something that we can do uh, to pray for you to encourage you or you wonder i'm not getting the emails i didn't know there was a women's thing that kind of thing um, get on the list so we can keep you updated 
uh, and there's a spot on there for prayer requests as well. And if you need to slip this under the door in my desk, as you in my office, or you don't want anybody, I understand that too. You can take those steps to not feel like you want to put it in there. And then the next announcement I wanted to make, um, Maria has done just an absolutely amazing job. We are setting up a, a prayer room in there. It's actually the Stan Christopher Memorial Prayer Room. We wanted to honor his influence in this church, but she actually had a really small little version of like a Western wall done in there. And, and here's a little plaque that, that talks a little bit about it. And that's not an idol. We're not bowing down to some wall. But sometimes there is this idea where we can actually kind of just have a moment with the Lord in the prayer room. And, and maybe you could take a, a tiny little prayer. And, and if you write it in there, I cannot promise you somebody wouldn't look at it. So you want to be careful. I'm just keeping it real. I, I don't know. I wouldn't. But you could just put little initials or whatever's on your heart and you want to put it in that prayer wall. And, or if you need a pastor, myself, Steve Brewer, Andy, anybody to pray with you. Or ladies, there's more than enough gals too if you want to just spend some time in that prayer room. But we just really encourage you to use that. And so um, it's there, okay? All right, today also um, we're looking at something just a, a little bit different as we jump into the text. It's in our series, in this Old Testament series that we've started. We've seen a lot of things that are are frankly mind-boggling. I mean, you started off maybe kind of easy looking at Abraham and threw his wife under the bus. You know, you go spend the night with this guy to save my skin. And and you kind of go, yeah, we do that, but we do it differently. Uh, Not the same way, but maybe you related to him and that's caused a problem in your marriage. Or or we've gone down through the line looking at Jacob manipulate and Moses lying and murdering. You're kind of going through. But to me, the the one that hit home the most was, was King David. And I know I've mentioned it subsequent to that just a couple of times, but this is the one that hits home because he committed adultery, he arranged to murder her husband, and then he married her, and he employed such a tactic that other men were killed. And you've heard worse stories on the news, but have you realized that this was done by a man that God says had a heart after his? And so you're kind of going like, how how did that happen? And probably the best way to describe that would be to realize that there is a sinful desire inside of all of us. Even those that are Christian, like there's a a theological point, like you were crucified with Christ and that, that old man, like everything you were, he's been rendered ineffective, but he's laying there. And if we're honest, he still speaks and we still obey. He still engages our lusts and our desires and all these things in it. And it can be blinding. And that is probably the only explanation of you. How in the world could David have done that? Because he was blinded by his own sinful desires. And then you say yes, and you do things from a place that you would have absolutely said no to under most circumstances. And so what I wanted to talk to today is that overcoming the past, specifically shame. I don't put shame in the bulletin because you won't come. The same reason when I speak on prayer, you'll never know in advance. Because you won't show up. I mean, it's just... Sorry, you wouldn't. Most, excuse me. Never announce when you're going to speak on shame or prayer, you'll have an empty. These things just tend to hit us, and they can be very, very difficult. But I want to talk today about how to move on from that. By the grace of God, we can do just that. What is shame? A bit of a secular definition here. A painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong behavior, of wrong done. And I'll say biblically, it goes one step further because what happens when you've done something that you see as just like this unforgivable, horrible thing is you don't identify anymore as a human being made in the image of God or if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you no longer identify with what God says is true about you. You literally are a set-apart saint in his eyes, in your worst moment. You don't identify with that anymore. You identify with what you've done. That's what you see. And that can be so, so difficult because God absolutely does not want us living in the past riddled with shame and guilt for our past failures, whatever they may be. Oh my gosh, that I lived for years of my life. So grateful. My significant failures in life were before the internet, all over the enterprise it was called. Pyramid pushing ex cop pleads guilty to corruption. <laughs> That's what I was. It's not what I am now. Now I'm a saint set apart in Christ. That's my identity. If somebody else wants to hold the past against me, let them. That past brought me to a new place. 
of understanding grace and of being a Christian, but how do we move on from it? Shame should not be really associated with guilt. I think to a certain degree, guilt is a good thing. If you've done something wrong and you're guilty of it, you should feel a little bit of guilt. And maybe you apologize and you can restore it. Conviction is a good thing. Because without conviction, you wouldn't know you were guilty. And if you don't know you're guilty, and if you don't feel convicted, then you won't see your need for Christ. So guilt and conviction are normal everyday experiences. It's when it's so bad, or when you think it's so bad, that you now identify with what you did, and not as a human being made in the image of God, or not as a Christian, right? And so what happens is you, you tend to look around the room. We all do this. And because everybody's a little bit better than, you know, on Sundays... We look around, everyone's got it together but me. Now, there's a couple people with quirks I can tell. That's probably over there. That guy's a, he's an A. I know they're solid. They're in the band. They got it all together. They're an A. I got over there, A plus. I gravitate towards the C's. I'm going to hang out with the C because I'm an F. And I can't project to be an A, but I can project to be a C, an average Christian. And I've just completely lost who I am in Christ. And if I grade myself as an F, I will respond to the F. I will respond to the shame, but I will not respond to the Lord. That is a huge problem, hence the cycles of nonstop defeat. Shame, it's absolutely devastating. But let's go back and look at its source. And I, I want to look at it today kind of from a couple different perspectives, like theologically, what does the, the truth from the word of God say? And then we'll look at it even in more of a relationship. The ultimate goal is I don't care in a sense who you are or what you've done. This is applicable for us. We all need to move on. That's why the rearview mirror is so small. Just glance every once in a while. But we're looking forward. We are moving on. All of us have to do that. Shame comes from our sin. We can go back all the way to the first sin where Adam and Eve were told, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. You're going to be subservient little dominators under my authority. I decide what is right, what is wrong. Got it? You don't need that. I got that. That's my decision. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you know the story, and you're affected by the story. Because when they ate, they became sinners. When you were born, you were born with their sinful infection. So we all have the same problem. What we were exposed to as sinners young determines possibly how corrupt in that state of messiness that our lives are. But let's go back. At the moment their eyes, the moment they sinned, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Something immediately, boom, had changed. I, I'm, they're not the, I'm not the same anymore. What, what has happened? I want to cover up. I feel something is wrong with me now. And this isn't acceptable to be wrong. Like I've got to somehow find a way to deal with that. In, in comes religion. Now religion will fix it, right? And so what did they do? They, they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. That, okay, at least now nobody else knows. I, I still have that feeling inside, but, but I've taken a step to cover it up. Is that... Is that what we do, we, we cover it up. We can fool each other that way. We do all the time. But God still comes knocking. When the cool evening breeze was blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And the Lord God called them, where are you? So not only do we want to hide from God, we want to hide from man, we want to function in this method of shame where no one else knows and we can hide from it. The goal isn't to hide from it, it's to get it out, deal with it, see yourself as restored and redeemed and lovable and forgiven and move on. Where are you? I'm right here. All my baggage, all my brokenness. I'm here, God. What, what possibly can we do? Again, let's consider it from a theological perspective and then also a relational perspective, but we absolutely cannot let shame change our identity. It cannot change who we are, and it shouldn't change the way we view ourselves. Our identity. You get a glimpse of it even in Genesis account. 
The story goes on, and they're promised the Savior in Genesis 3.15. We know that is Jesus Christ. That's the first gospel. But there's a little more to it than that. See, later on in the narrative, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Well, wait a minute. She literally is the mother of everybody that's dead now because she died spiritually and emotionally and all born to her. I mean, I don't know how many grandmas we got to put in there, but she's grandma to you. We all descend from them. So we relate, but she's the, now the mother of the living, but she just died. It doesn't make sense. To the Jewish mind, that's an identity issue. God does not her, want her living with this identity that you help bring death to everybody. That would be a horrible identity to live with. But he cares about the shame too. Because it says the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. I'll deal with the guilt, right? And whatever made the skin, some people say it was Bambi. I'm guessing it's closer to a lamb. Something died. And then something was provided for them to cover up. God cares about the shame. He does not want us going through life absolutely riddled with shame. You have, as a believer in here today, you have a new identity. You are a saint. And when Jesus died, our guilt went on to his person. He owned it. He took it to the grave and left it there. And by faith, we have to say that shame goes with it. He died for our shame, and I have a new identity. That old man, that which I was before Jesus Christ, that is not me anymore. In fact, you want to hear, I think, in your time of failure, in my time of failure, the greatest biblical truth, sorry, who am I to say there's any one, but in my opinion, one of the greatest biblical truths out there are found in Romans chapter 7. Look at what the Apostle Paul says, talking about his own frustration with sin. I don't want to put the full verse up there because we'll just go into a different mode. Let's just take the highlights of it. He says in verse 17, it is no longer I the one doing it. That's not me. That's not my identity. That sin that still dwells in me. So let's just say for a moment like David, that sin got a hold of me. And I did atrocious and horrible things. And there's steps to restore. There's repentance. There's growth. There's all these things that need to happen. But at some point, you can look at your past and claim this just like the Apostle Paul. It's not me that did that. 1 John 3 Verse 9 says, he who is born of God does not sin. He cannot sin because the seed, that's Christ, dwells within him. So when we sin, it's actually not us. We are allowed, like Paul, to disassociate from that. That's that old man. That's that sin that still dwells in there, but that's not me. I'm a child of God, and I will repent. I will confess, and by the grace of God, I will move on from that but we have to come to terms with this. He says the same thing in verse 21. So if anybody in here thinks, oh yeah, he's trying to encourage the sinners today. That's not me. <laughs> Maybe I haven't blown it as bad as I have or as bad as others have. But yes, this is what Paul says. There's evil, evil present in me. The one who wants to do good. And if we are not going to have a close, proper, personal relationship with Jesus, then flesh will take over. It is the default, and that evil will gain footage, and you will do evil things. But Paul, once again, it's present in me, but I'm the one who wants to do good. I don't want that in my life. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to return to the nonsense. I want to move on. You can, saint. You can, people. Just look at that and go, that's not me. And I tell you this too, as you began to embrace these deeper truths, especially those of you that are married, like live and understand that because it's so much easier to forgive when you realize that your spouse just functioned in that flesh. You have it too. And you can kind of at least relate to how and why it happened. These are critical truths. In fact, in the Jewish sacrificial system, 
I love that. He laid out this entire system where he allowed lambs, like he allowed sheep to die the death that we deserve, right? So we'd get together, and then on the Day of Atonement, they'd kind of have a priest do it, but even personally, on a regular basis, you could lay your hands on the lamb. Your guilt was transferred to the lamb, and the lamb died the death that you deserve. There's no moral requirements. You can be the biggest loser in all of Israel, and you bring a lamb, and you trust what God has said, that the guilt of the lamb, excuse me, that the guilt of the sinner is transferred to the Lamb. And it's at the Day of Atonement. And it is all there so you would understand who Jesus is as your sin bearer. Your guilt, your shame transferred onto him and you leave clean and forgiven. And it's deeper than those in Leviticus understood it. Because Jesus Christ's sacrifice isn't until the next sin. It isn't until the next Day of Atonement. It is eternal atonement. Rest in that. But there's also... In Leviticus, there's another lamb. I thought somebody was playing Mary had a little lamb. Like, that's a cool trick. <laughs> Let's look at the second lamb. The first one, Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. Two goats, two lambs. This guy had a bad day. He's dying. He's the one that goes and pre-shadows Jesus but there's a second goat. The goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it to send it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. That's right. You're guilty. I'm guilty. And Jesus is our scapegoat. Now, you don't get to blame him, but you allow your shame to be transferred onto him, and they didn't kill this one. They drove it far, far away out into the wilderness, and Jewish tradition says they would push it off a cliff, but I don't know. You have a scapegoat. Your shame goes on to Christ as well. But what do we have a tendency to do? We don't want to admit that we've walked in the flesh, that we've hurt people so instantly, right? It's what? It's blaming somebody else. Statistically speaking, within Christianity, outside Christianity, people will only confess to what they know for a fact they have been caught doing. And then they blame. Who did Adam blame? Eve and God. <laughs> the woman you gave me. How many of us blame God? I was born into this situation. My dad did this. My mom did this. Oh, no, God, this is the family you gave me. We want to do that all the time. It was my husband. It was my wife. Eve said, nah, it was the devil. We're so quick to do that too, huh? The devil made me do it. He tempted you. That's all he can do. He cannot make you do anything. The scriptures teach you, you're a Christian. Greater he that is in you than he that is in the world. When you stand firm in the grace of God, Ephesians 6, with the full armor of God, the devil can't do anything. He will dangle the carrot, you will nibble, nibble, crunch, and then he will condemn you. But you did it. We don't get to scapegoat. We don't get to blame other people. That's what our first tendency is. Own it and let the proper scapegoat have it. In the name of Jesus Christ, dismiss your shame. Put it behind you once and for all. Now, let's view this now maybe from more of a, a relational sense, right? Like, what does Jesus think of it? Let's watch Jesus interact with something that's probably not far off from, from David in a, in a different light. See, the apostle Peter Jesus announced his death and he said, no way. If I have to die with you, I'm your go-to. I'm the one guy that's going to stick with you through thick and thin, right? How many times in an attempt to, to get rid of our shame have we recommitted our lives to Christ? Like, that's going to fix it. Let me try again. New Year's resolution coming? Word of advice, don't do that. This is the time I get it right. Yeah, I'm going to buckle down and really be serious. You're going to end up like Peter. Let's look at this. So Jesus gets arrested after Peter's boasting. Have arrested him. They led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. Peter was following at a distance. After they'd kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a servant girl, seeing him, sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, this man was with him too. But he, Peter, denied it, saying, woman, I, I don't know him. Three years. 
he was amongst the leaders of the 12. I, I don't know him. He just disavowed Jesus Christ. A little later, another saw him and said, you're one of them too, Peter said. Man, back off. I'm not. I'm not one of those guys. After about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he's a Galilean too. Peter said, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. This ain't my party. This ain't my show. I had nothing to do with this Messiah guy. That wasn't me. I, I wasn't there. He's unpacking it. He's pleading his case. I don't know him. Imagine how he lived with that. And of course, Jesus had told him, you're going to deny me three times before that rooster crows. And that rooster crowed. How deep that must have penetrated Peter. How deep. And at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. Oh, no. What have I done? How he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. He could relate to that. And, and I know for us today, like, we have not really faced situations where the persecution has gotten so brutal that we would deny Jesus Christ for fear of death. But throughout history, it has happened. It happened then, and it happened now. It happened before Peter. It happened after Peter. I wonder if Peter was familiar with the story we looked at last week. Had Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego crank the fire. He's going to deliver us, but if he doesn't, then we cook. Peter knew that story. Profound, profound Failure. So Jesus invites him to breakfast. I love this. We look at Peter's restoration here. After he rose from the grave, he had a, a men's breakfast on the beach in Galilee. Come and have breakfast. Maybe some of us just need to come and have breakfast. Just sit with Jesus. Enjoy his grace and his mercy as found in this text. None of the disciples ventured to question him who you are, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus would manifest himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. They're all sitting there. You, you, you can't help but wonder, like, little chit-chat, like, hey, what was the whole death thing like? Where'd you go? You come back. Like, questions I would ask, really not privy to it. Wouldn't you have just a million questions in that moment? <laughs> wonder what Peter's question was. <laughs> Where's this put me with you? I, I did what most people would have got cooked for. I, I, I blew it in that moment, even in... In, in front of a in misogyny is real, and it's there, even in a little girl. I, I, I cowered in, even before a girl, like Peter's sitting there going, you guys are talking about some cool stuff, but stick a fork in me, I'm done. I failed Jesus Christ at the most intense time of his life and my life. Like, what do you do with that failure? How do you process that failure? Wow. So when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, put yourself in that moment. Mm -hmm. Here it comes. Here it comes, Simon, son of John. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? And uh, every pastor who preaches on it, it's a, every commentator has to try and figure out what are the these? It could be the fishing nets. My guess this is a public breakfast. My guess it was the other men because Peter had so boastfully said, if these guys bail, I'm your go-to. I'm your foxhole guy. I will be there through thick and thin. And when these guys leave you, I'm the one you can count on. So these there probably is. Peter, do you grade yourself as an A plus? Or did Peter grade himself with an F? Do you love me? More than these, he said to him. He used the word there, agape. So two or three 
Words in Greek, too, primarily in the New Testament for love. Agape is the love where you pay a dear price for the blessing and benefit of somebody else, even if you hate their guts, even if they annoy you, even if you wish they'd pick another church, even if you have all these unresolved issues with them, God still expects agape from your person towards them. Uh, now we're all feeling like an F, huh? Oops, yeah. This is agape. This is a hardcore love, and it does not actually depend on your emotions. Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But when he responds, he doesn't use agape. And this is one area where our translators are probably like, I don't even know what to do with this because they're both kinds of love. And in English, we only have one. And they wouldn't want to go so far as to say, well, I just like you or I have affections for you. Peter downgraded the love in his response. He wouldn't dare say that his heart was full of agape. I will agape you. In a sense, it's like he's remembering, yeah, I thought that way once before. Jesus, I'm not really able to say that, agape. I'm going to say phileo. We named Philadelphia after that, the city of brotherly love. It's a strong affection towards another person. That's what Peter used. That's where I'm at. I have this affection for you, but to suggest again that I'm an agape kind of guy when it comes to my spirituality, I can't do it. I won't do it. Humility, we like that. Peter was very humble in his response. Jesus said to him, get it together. Learn to love me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Oh, wait, no. That's law. The purpose of that command is for you to land right where Peter just landed. I can't do that. I can't love you the way I'm supposed to. I can't do anything right. I can't even get my bed made my kids out the door. And I'm supposed to love God with all that I am all the time? Take the grace Take the grace. Take the grace. Love the Lord your God. That is the law. You don't bank on your love for him. You bank on his for you. That's what makes the true difference. But Jesus didn't say that. Tend my lambs. Take care of my people. What, from Philadelphia? Yeah, from Philadelphia. I'll take that from you, Peter. I'll take that from you. He said to him a second time, Simon... Son of John, do you love me? Again, agape. Do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but I'm still right here. This is phileo. I, I'm, not, I'm not going there again a second time, really. You, you don't? You can't pull that off? No, nope, I'm still down here. I won't make that claim. I will not allow my relationship with you to be dependent on my love for you. My relationship with you is going to come and flow from your agape to me. That's humility. Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. I'm priming you for ministry because what I want is I want someone that does care. Peter cared. Don't, don't misunderstand me. We can't muster up even affections for Jesus, like even gratitude for Jesus. I don't... I, all I can do is start from scratch with the gospel, but surely all of us have come far enough where we can at least say, I love the Lord. I won't make the claim of agape, but all that he's done for me, I'm right there. Shepherd my sheep. I'm okay with that, Peter. I need you in ministry. I need you to step up and be what you can be with me. Do some ministry for me. Where's the part where he really lets him have it? not there. It's just not there. He said to him a third time, oh no, again we're going to go through this. Peter must be thinking, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Only this time Jesus used phileo. Jesus used the lesser of the two loves. Do you love me? And he said, Lord, you, you know everything. You know where I'm at. He knows where you're at. Maybe you're agape. I would suggest you walk that back a little bit. Maybe in that moment, but you know all things. You know that I have this affection for you, Lord. And now they're on the same page. Jesus said, tend my sheep. I'm fine with that. He had rejected Jesus Christ in the most insane way possible. And once again, I don't know that any of us will face a decision 
to proclaim Jesus Christ or die. Did a little research, it happened in Columbine. Remember the first school shooting? They're so common now, you almost have to go through a Rolodex in your mind. Girl stood up, I believe in God, and got shot right in the head. So it's not outside the realm of possibility, but if we're keeping it real, most of our rejection is through our attitude and our conduct, right? Like, oh, we fail them all the time. We can relate to that. But he would say the same thing to you. Get up. Tend my sheep. Go right back to where you were because I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I said I will remember your sins no more. As far as the East is from the West, I don't remember. I don't remember. So where does the memory that haunts us come from? Is God making me feel guilty once again because of what I've done? It's not from God. It's not from God. It's either from your own burned conscience because you cannot embrace the grace to forgive yourself and move on, or more likely, it's from the devil because he will tempt that carrot, lure you away, nibble, nibble, crunch, enjoy, and then will turn on you and absolutely drag you through the gutters for as long as you will let him. And your pencil's dull. My kids, I, I, they're amazing ability to draw. Daddy, I can't do it as good anymore because my pencil's not sharp. Son, let me have that pencil. Let me sharpen it for you. And you know what, guys? If shame has dulled your pencil, God wants you to let him sharpen it through his grace so that you can make a mark that will last for eternity. Sometimes the sharpening, if you were the pencil, it can be a little bit painful. There are consequences for our actions and they are real. But there is profound forgiveness and all of us have to realize that we can say that's in the past. I did it. It's over. God's forgotten about it. I am a child of God and I'm going to raise my head up and move on. I'm going to continue to tend lambs, to feed sheep, to be a part of a church, to encourage my brothers and sisters. I'm going to pick myself back up by the grace of God. I'm going to move on. Can we do that today? Because you haven't outdone King David. Maybe Abraham. I feel like I've thrown my wife under the bus in some different contexts at times. I, well, never mind what I did, didn't do, but I didn't do what Abraham did, just to clarify. But maybe somewhere on that journey, you could go, there's, there's my shame. And I'm going to relive it. And I'm going to sulk in it. And for some, it was that, that one moment where you blew it. That, just that one moment. For others, it's like, I was blowing it all through those years, and I didn't even realize it. I wasn't in a place where I could get a handle on it and move on. It can cover massive, massive periods of time. We went through it in two chapters. Do you know how long David's sinful mess was strung out over? So sometimes it's a lifetime of guilt and shame. And you know what? I want to clar clarify something else, too, as it comes to shame. There's two kinds of shame. There's a false shame. That's the shame that's put on victims of abuse or victims of, of whatever it might be. They feel a shame for that, and I'm so sorry. And that's, that's a different shame. That's a false shame. You're a victim. You didn't do anything. I don't know that I can fix that today, but boy, if I could or if we could help you get some therapy to flush that nonsense out. But I'm talking about the shame from what we've done. That's more important right now. How do we wrestle with it? First of all, we got to confess the truth. Oops, excuse me. We have to confess the truth. And this is crazy, but the whole truth. The whole truth, even if it makes the situation worse, because here's what happens, is you hold back part of it. And again, people only confess to what they know they've been caught doing. Don't be that person. You lay it all out there. Here's what I did. Well, that's going to hurt my spouse more. That's going to hurt. Doesn't matter. You got to get it out, because if not, the devil's got a bullet, and the bullet is your lie. And he's going to use the bullet as a shame, or when you think it's all over, and you've redeemed and restored, boom, 
There it is. Because we're holding that. And I do think we need to take steps to restore the damage. I don't even want to comment on what that looks like. But if there's something you can do, making yourself more accountable, making yourself an open book, whatever it is, if you've hurt people, apologize, ask for forgiveness, tell them about the journey you've on. Don't say you're sorry. So that's what you tell your kids, say you're sorry. I can't wait for the day when I don't have to say that, but when my kids will come up to one another and go, you know what, here's what I did, and why, not even why, would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? That's so powerful. Restore the damage and get some help, especially if it's something that is just reoccurring, reoccurring. Get some help. I can start with me. If I can't, we'll, we'll, we'll go to the next level with it. We'll do whatever we have to do. And you know what, too? We got to get to a point where in that failure, we will embrace the grace of God. Embrace the grace. I love that. You know, the law says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, the law, that's moral conduct that you're supposed to keep or what have you in the Old Testament. It came in so that sin would increase. Now you're aware of it. All 10 commandments, all 613. The goal of that was so that you would see yourself as sinful. But then he says, but when sin increased, Grace abounded all the more. It's stronger in the Greek language. Like it's super abounded. You can't out sin God's grace. Please don't try. Please don't misunderstand that. When your sin increased, his grace increased all the more. And it is by faith that you have to accept that grace. Because sin, as a principle, it reigns in death. And it reigns when we lock onto it. It's like the kid that touches the electric fence and he can't let go. It's like, <laughs> It's killing him, but he can't let go. It rains. Sin will rain if you let it. But for the Christian, he says, grace will reign the righteousness in Jesus Christ. Let go of the fence. Let go of the past. Let grace reign in your life, not shame. I don't know that you can do that, so let's pray and ask him, should we? Father in heaven, failures. Of all sorts, I imagine, sit in this room. Don't need to know, don't want to know. Got my own, my own little dark spots, my own little things that, boy, I'm sure glad no one else knows about. But you, you know, you see through the fig leaves and you give us grace. Nobody knows us like you do and nobody loves us like you do. I pray for everyone here that is looking back on life or looking at the moment with darkness from failure. And that they would just dismiss their shame to our Savior, Jesus Christ. You died for our guilt. You died for our shame. Father, it is a God-sized miracle when your people will rise up and say, shame no more. Let grace reign. And I ask that you do work in all of our hearts, in all of our lives, whatever we've done. Your mercies are new every day. Father, again, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our God, man, Savior, and what he's done for us. And if there's somebody here like, I don't know about the whole Jesus thing, I think I'm a fig leaf kind of person because I got this going on and that going on and this church and this religion that they would just stop right now and realize only you can forgive sins, and that is by faith. And for the rest of us that carry it, Jesus, would you be our scapegoat? Would you carry that guilt and shame away and bury it as far as the east is from the West. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. The dark trying to hide you, steal you away. Death trying to keep you inside the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tear down the wall. Listen, the weight of your burden, you carry.
Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot stop. Would you stand as we close?